Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good, good morning, wherever you are around, are around the world. This is Joseph Trevisani from Worldwide Markets. Um, I thank you for attending our webinar today, which is put on uh, weekly on Mondays in conjunction with FX Street on technology. Technology rules, actually, is what I titled this, Shale on the Evolution of the Commodity Market. <clears throat> What you're looking at here um, is not a schematic of a pyramid that I rescued from the dusty depths of a tomb in Egypt. It is, however, a chart of uh, back to 19, I believe it's back to 19, it's about 10 years on this chart, um, a little bit more, about 20 years, back to the beginning of the Boomberg commodities market. Um, actually, this is, excuse me, this is a, uh, <clears throat> the DXY and the uh, Bloomberg Commodities, which is in brown, and the DXY, which is in green. And the reason I started with this chart rather than a, um, a chart of any specific commodity uh, is because, and appropriate to the, uh, putting it in juxtaposition to the dollars is a very specific choice. What we have been seeing over the past, uh, my guess is 20 years, um, <clears throat> which is about the time, so we're 17, so about from here, remember DXY is in green, has been a revolution in both commodity extraction, commodity production, and pricing. It is the adage, the very capitalist adage, personified of the cure for high prices is high prices. What we have seen, and this of course has been abetted by a number of things, primarily the seemingly permanent low regimen of interest rates brought on by the world's central banks. But let's take one step back, and before we saw this revolution that we've seen, let's look at another price chart here. Okay, this is a price of probably the premier industrial commodity in the world. I think we all know what that is. It's oil. We have DXY again in green, and we have the generic oil price in uh, WTI actually, the American crude standard in purple. And the interesting thing about this chart is the same, of course it's, it, it comprises a good deal of the Bloomberg Commodities Index, so you're essentially with the same thing, but I could get an oil chart that went back a further uh, eight years, so I decided to use oil for this, is this peak right here, the pyramid, the one I did not rescue from the tomb of Ramses or any of his descendants. The notion embodied on this roll, on this, roar, on this rise in oil prices, and every time there's there's a move, a, a pronounced move or a trend in the markets, somebody comes up with two things. One, a theory to explain it, and two, a reason why this is going to be the permanent state of that particular market. Uh, there's a famous quote, and I forget who it's from, from the era just before the, the depression and the crash in 29. And he was a famous economist, I believe, but unfortunately I don't remember his name. If anybody remembers his name, please type it in. Um, and he said that equity prices have reached a new and permanently high plateau. Well, that certainly did not turn out to be the case. After the crash and the depression, it took 25 years, 1954 approximately, for the Dow level to reach what it had been at 
just prior at the peak, just prior to the crash of, 19, of October 1929. So there's always a theory for everything. Most of them don't turn out to be true. Most of the time, the markets do what we expect them to do when we study oscillators, and that's revert to the mean. But don't be surprised if you find a new, and this goes for both sides, permanently low and permanently high. But for reasons that I will explain in a few minutes, the trend is in one direction, and that's lower. But let's first of all deal with this right now. Shale turns out to be a symbol, among many other things, of things that were always of, of a particular rule of technology that we are seemingly always forgetting. We've seen this before, yet we forget it. In the 1970s, um, apropos, of course, of the emotional atmosphere of the 1960s, of which I was just a mere, a mere child at the time, certainly more worried about climbing trees and running through brooks and hunting for salamanders than I was concerned about the future of the world. Um, there were a number of books, um, the most famous one, but a whole movement dedicated to explaining how humanity was about to blow itself up, starve itself to death, and basically just turn out to be a very bad player in the global uh, ecology. The book, I think, was Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. I think I've spoken of it before. I'm not particularly picking on Paul Ehrlich, who I believe is still with us. Um, but as an, emblem, as an emblem, an emblematic of a particular type of thinking, which references the real world only so far as necessary to prove its own predetermined thesis. This is an idea which come, these are ideas which come from come whole, if you will, from someone's view of the world, rather than are built up by empirical, by an attempt, by attempts to explain empirical reality. Mr. Ehrlich's thesis was that by the late 70s and certainly the early 80s, much of the world would be starving. There would be wars over food, probably wars over water and other resources. The basic vision of that idea was the incredibly limited ability of both the planet and its resources and man and its technology to provide for the burgeoning population of the planet. At the time, I believe the world population was probably about three billion, maybe three and a half. It's probably eight now. Clearly, that idea of limitations was incorrect. Well, it's latest in here, and what was the difference? Well, the difference was mankind itself. And that's the ability of the human species, the human race, to in its technological guise, which it is in now, to adapt to changing situations. And not just changing situations, because individual people are pretty good at adapting. You know, well, I've been driving a lot lately, um, and one of the things that I find absolutely remarkable is cro our, our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, has been around, I don't know, about 200, 250,000 years or something like that. And for the vast majority of that time, we did not drive. We did not drive cars. We did not drive bicycles. We didn't drive airplanes. We didn't drive gliders. We didn't really do anything except maybe climb a tree. And the only thing I think of when I was driving yesterday, I was on the road for about two hours, was how phenomenally good Homo sapiens sapiens is at driving cars. Yes, you say there are accidents, people do dumb things all the time. But if you think about 
the number of miles driven in a country like the United States and the accident rate, the serious accident rate, or just the accident rate in general, it's phenomenally low. Phenomenally. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. If, you know, there was a 50-50 chance of getting into a bang-up, every time you went out in your car, we probably would drive a whole lot less. It would have invented other types of transportation to get us where we're going, or we wouldn't go somewhere. But no, that's not the case. Human beings, homo sapiens sapiens, turns out to be really good at driving cars. Maybe it was already inherent, or it's simply an activity that one, we both enjoy, that mankind enjoys, by and large. My mother did not like driving, but everybody else I know kind of likes driving. Um, and it fits perfectly, almost, with our inherent physiological abilities. There is no creature that has ever existed in our planet. Um, we can't speak of other planets, despite the fact that I've been watching all sorts of science fiction shows lately, um, which is a long, uh, long uh, interest of mine. Is that we are very, very, very adaptable. Well, one of the things, the key, as a matter of fact, more than anything else, it's the key to the success and the history of mankind. Now, we were adaptable as creatures because we're essentially the same creatures except for the overlay of culture that we were in the Middle Ages, that we were under the Romans or the Han Chinese or the Tibetan Empire of the 8th century or anywhere else in history and in culture that you want to envision. We are the same. But what's different is not only are we the same and adaptable, but the technologies that we invent and the systems that we have, basically capitalism, that support and foster and enable and promote our technology is also incredibly adaptable. The food famines, the famines, the food riots, the wars, predicted, and not just by Paul Ehrlich, who is, unfortunately has become a poster child of mine for getting things completely wrong, um, The thing that is missed, and very, and part of it is is, is understandable because it's almost impossible to predict new technologies. I mean, if you were going to imagine in 1980, and except for a few people who did imagine it, that we'd all be walking around with the essence of a Star Trek communicator. 20 years later, everybody said, you're, you're bananas. But that's what happened. The same for the predicted food riots and other things, uh, food wars of the 19, supposedly 1980s and 90s. They never happened because technology provided the answer. Now, I am not trying to say that technology provides always, uh, always provides the answers. But one of the things that we must accept if we're going to make an attempt to look at the future is not to underestimate the ability of technological society powered by a profit motive to provide answers. Now, an example that didn't turn out was from the 1950s when the advent of the hydrogen bomb, not the, the uranium bomb, but the hydrogen bomb, the fusion bomb, the bomb that requires the uranium bomb to set it off and that powers the sun and the rest of the universe would shortly because of its both plentiful supply of fuel 
uh, helium and hydrogen. Uh, wait a minute, hydrogen, and its uh, ability and lack of dangerous byproducts. You don't end up with um, waste material with a half life of fifty thousand years that's poisonous for you know forty nine thousand of those years. Um, that soon human culture, human society would be powered by fusion reaction, clean, endlessly renewable, and inexhaustible energy sources. That did not turn out to be the case. Technology did not provide that answer. After 70 years of attempts and thinking about it, um, there has yet to be a fusion reaction, a fusion reactor, not fission, fusion that is both self-sustaining and produces more energy than is necessary than is used to create it nevertheless in many other areas technology has provided the answer food being one okay the next item and, and when you talk about food and resources you're really talking about the same idea that the, and it's a very popular, in a way, I guess, because it's emotionally satisfying. Um, it's sort of not the idea of the Renaissance. What a work of, what a work of is man. I forget the quote. Um, where man is the measure of all things. The proper study of man is man. Um, it's not that idea at all. It's the idea of man as an interloper, as a destroyer, as a outgrowth, almost an excrescence on existence, on the natural creation. So the idea of technology providing an answer is something that does not get factored and in many ways it can't be if you're looking at let's just let, let's, let's let's move a little bit from the generic from the general and the philosophical uh to the specific which is peak oil this period right here in the chart from like 1998 up to that ridiculous peak in 2008 of $150 or whatever it was for a gallon of, for a, a gallon of oil. And one of the theories that was out at the time, and you'll still hear it occasionally referenced, um, you just give you an idea, there was another um, sociological theory in the United States theory, it wasn't a theory. Um, the great crime wave that peaked in the United States in the late 80s and the early 90s um, was predicted by a number of sociologists and others who pardon me, but pretend to a scientific discipline, that it would get worse and worse and we would be in live nowadays in the era of the super predator, whatever that meant. Um, we would move on to the world of a clockwork orange, Anthony Burgess's amazingly accurate in some ways prediction of, uh, and he wrote it, I believe, in the 70s, um, of the future that was coming the sort of the dissolution of society into into violent clans basically and the inability of government and culture to deal with it now we all know that at least in the united states and everywhere else this did not happen and i have yet to see a coherent sociological explanation for why this didn't happen but it did not the deterministic explanations of a prior generation as to why crime was rising based on poverty uh, were clearly, if you will, the Marxist interpretation, were clearly inaccurate because poverty, poverty didn't change very much in the period in which crime declined by well more than half. So without dwelling too much on that, again, we have another change in society, this time on the cultural side, um, which did not which was unpredicted. The people who dealt it or were in the forefront of 
bringing about this change. And there are other reasons. This is why, why I'm so fascinated by this one. Because although some of the theories of different kinds of police work here in the United States, um, starting with Benjamin Bratton in New York at the time under Rudolph Giuliani, um, were purely from a practical point of view. There was no grand sociological cultural theory that we're doing something here and we're going to change the way the culture <clears throat> and people growing up in that culture look at crime and participate in crime. There's nothing like that. It was simply practical police work. Whether you can say that that practical police work and its clear success um, went over into general culture and then helped people change their minds is well beyond anything that I want to go into here. But again, we have another example of an unexpected development affecting a very wide range of society. So in this period here, we had the theory of peak oil. And I'll, I'll, I'll read you what I wrote in the write-up today in case you didn't read it. Peak oil, the notion that markets and industrial nations, that's all of us, were doomed to an ever-restricting supply and an ever-higher price for crude oil, the basic industrial commodity, has proven to be one of the great fallacies of modern economics. That is simply an empirical statement. It doesn't mean that drilling for oil or fracking is good or bad. It doesn't mean that mankind is an interloper in the natural world, Shiva, the destroyer, or is an improvement. It doesn't mean any of that. It's simply a empirical statement. Peak oil was a theory that was quite prevalent, and you can still find it around now. They're still making the same noise. Um, I mean, there's enough shale oil out there to run the world's economy even at an increasing rate for maybe 200 years at, that we know of now. In 200 years, maybe we'll find something else. Who knows? Um, industrial society is predicated on the availability of energy. That is what drives everything. If there is no energy, then there is no manufacturing, there is no steam, if there's no cheap energy. Coal in the, in the Iron Age, no, the Iron Age, sorry, not the Iron Age, I'll think of the Iron Horse Age. Um, to change a six month or four month voyage in a ship around Cape Horn to a six day trip across the country on a train or a two week trip. What made that possible? Coal. Coal and coke for industrial metal production. Coal to drive steam engines across the country. It's the availability of cheap energy that is the sine qua non, that which without nothing, nothing else, Latin, um, is the basis of uh, industrial society. Now, a lot of these ideas come from an excellent book that I can recommend everyone read. It's by Matt Ridley, a British author, a member of the House of Lords, I believe. It's called The Rational Optimist. And he is talking about many of these ideas are borrowed or elaborated on uh, the ideas in this book. Um, and I want to give credit where credit is due, since it's a brilliant book. Um, it's not one that, that you know, gets much coverage, although I, many people know about it, simply because it's optimistic. Its basic premise is that technological society, um, powered by the profit motive of capitalism, has found answers to many, many problems. Doesn't mean that mankind is suddenly a perfected creature, that our morals have kept pace with our abilities. It doesn't mean anything like that. It, again, it is an observational thesis. It is based on 150 or 200 years of technological evolution. And we're seeing an enormously compressed version of that 
in shale. This is 2008. 2008 yet be not a decade ago. A decade is 10 years, as we all know. Most of us who are listening here have many decades under the belt, so to speak, uh, myself included. So 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago, a little bit shorter, oil was uh, pricing out at, uh, you know, $150 a barrel. barrel. Uh, oil in the United States was rising per gallon uh, past $4. Relatively speaking, in a historical sense, that's still pretty cheap, meaning you still have availability, you can still drive your car. But from a modern economic point of view, that was pretty expensive. And what happened? Well, not a year and a half later, uh, oil was down around $30 a barrel. Now, that is not indicative of the technological revolution. Okay? That is indicative of markets, of a bubble in the markets. Okay, let me put up, uh, let me see if I have, yeah. now let's just keep it here. I'm, I'm going to put up the, uh, okay, this is essentially the same chart, although it's of a different, um, different commodity. Again, here we have the DXY, green, and we have this time the Bloomberg Commodities Index. It, it's, and of course, it's essentially the same chart. This period here, you can say it's from 2002, or you can say it's from 1999. It doesn't really matter. Of accelerating prices. Now, this isn't just, remember, this is the commodity. That's why I put it up. Remember, high price is its own remedy in a capitalist system. And we'll talk about that in a second. This period, 10 years, just say, of rising prices. Um, is both the cause, I mean, well, let's put it this way. The cause of that is twofold. What is the availability of funding, um, meaning interest rates? Money was very, very cheap for, for most of this period right here especially from 9-11 on, 2000, 2001. The Fed cap rate's probably far too low for far too long. So there's a great deal of money looking for someplace to go. Um, and much of it found its way into the markets and into projects. You got money, you got to do something with it, you can borrow it. So part of it drove the markets much higher, but one of the side effects, if you will, of oil prices and commodity prices so high is that it started to look like investing in resources, resource extraction, would be a very beneficial and profitable endeavor for the foreseeable future. Now, what was behind this? Part of it was sort of the advent on the world mind, if you will, or the, or the consciousness of the world, of the success and the power and the extent of China and the other developing nations ascent into industrial powers. Markets are psychological creatures. And at the time, this is the latest incarnation of the endless fascination with China from the West and the idea with all those people, you're bound to make a lot of money if you can just sell everybody one pencil. Well, at the time, and certainly in the markets, and into some of this period here as well, China was looked to be an exhaust, inexhaustible source of demand for all sorts of commodities. So one, you had cheap money, and two, you had this vision of China ever increasing demand for commodities. That didn't turn out to be true of case. Neither one of those turned out to be true. But what it did do was sponsor lots of new mines and also a new technology, shale oil fracking. Now, again, I am not commenting 
on whether this is a good idea from an ecological point of view. But what I am commenting on is the ability, the phenomenally rapid ability to develop oil resources which had hitherto been inaccessible, although known about for a long time, and provide that supply to the markets. What was supposed to be peak oil, meaning that the incredibly expensive oil at $150 would, because supply was running out. Well, if you don't have enough supply, what will happen? One, the price will go much, much higher, and two, y'all, and this was kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, the logic behind this idea, is that, that will force technological society to restrain itself and also to turn to other resources. Um, and of course, with the ecological reason behind this, they'll start turning towards renewable resources. And renewable resources are wonderful. However, they are not in a position as of yet, either technologically or supply-wise, to provide industrial society with the amount of cheap energy required. Now, again, this is not meant to be a judgment, it's simply a fact. You can't use solar energy really as anything but a supplement. One, you can't turn it on and off. And there are huge storage issues for energy, uh, for solar energy and electricity. Electricity does not work terribly well when stored. We don't have yet a very good, efficient way. We have batteries that can drive Teslas, but driving a Tesla is not providing the energy for entire societies. So again, regardless of what the your view on this is and what should or should not be, the only place that we can currently get the amount, an adaptable amount of energy required by an industrial society is currently from fossil fuels. I mean, you have to, run with the practical facts of this. So the advent of higher prices, as driven here and, and, and portrayed in the commodities index here, sponsored technological innovation. Technological culture is incredibly adaptive. Like its creator, the human species, it responds phenomenally well as a method for adapting to a changing environment. The changing environment was the diminishment of readily available oil supplies. The kind of easily tapped oil supplies that were available in West Texas, and before that in Pennsylvania and other places in the late 19th century. Actually, um, who just died? David, um, David Rockefeller just died uh, about a week or two ago, former head of Chase. But more interestingly for this topic, the last, he was 101, the last living grandson of John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller, who's business in oil goes back to the 1870s and the oil fields in Pennsylvania. That is now 140 years ago. Which is kind of an interesting just position for the discussion we're having here. The last grandson of John D. Rocco. Right now, if you're not an American, you're probably not as we're in mayor, many Americans are not probably aware of the absolutely phenomenal and interesting, fascinating history of the growth of industrial society in this country after the Civil War um, and the explosion that it precipitated in the economy and in living standards. Okay. 
So the higher price of oil in these 10 years brought on the fracking revolution. There's no question about that. If the discovery, if there had been other easily accessible oil that simply was waiting to be discovered and oil companies were looking everywhere, then there probably would have been no reason and no impetus for the shale oil revolution. But in fact, there wasn't. So these enormous supplies of oil are now available. So let's go and now let's look at the WTI price. Okay, this is WTI against the DXY. WTI is in purple. The question we really have here, let me see if I can, tell, let me see if I can find a longer one. A longer one for WTI. Hang on, sorry. No, this is where we're going to go back to it. We're going to go back, we're going to go back to the one I had before simply because the WTI uh, generic price as indicated um, does not go back far enough. I mean, God, the oil price does go back far enough, but it's not charted on the systems we're using. We're using now the Thomson Reuters system. Um, okay, so the purple here is the, the Bloomberg Commodities Index, which we're using as a proxy for the uh, oil price, but they're, they're, they're essentially the same thing. This change here, well, it gets back to $100 and then crashes all the way down to, uh, it's now in the 40s. Means what? The systemic change in the price of oil brought on by shale production. Here in the United States, in Canada, and if anybody really wants to be a player in the oil market these days, they're going to have to participate. Three, four years ago, the wellhead production price for much of the shale oil production was 60, 70, even $80 a barrel. That means simply that if oil is not there or higher, you cannot make a profit drilling for oil. So when oil's up here, great. When oil goes back to $100, wonderful. Now, at the same time, the more traditional fields in the Middle East and elsewhere have production costs, some of them in the 20s or the 30s. So there's an enormous disparity between who can produce and who's going to make money at it. The Saudis, as the world's largest swing producers, actually it's the U.S. now, um, but the U.S., of course, it's fragmented. There are all these different companies. The Saudis is actually determined by the government. But either way, the Saudis noting this decided to let the price, and OPEC as well, the price of oil fall, not try and support it by restricting supply. Why? The notion was to let it stay low for long enough, which would drive many American and Canadian shale producers from the market. Oil production is a high sunk cost endeavor. What does that mean? It means you've got to put up a lot of money to begin with before you start getting any money back. You need the money to drill, you need the money to pay to, for land leases, you need the money to pay your crews, you need money to process the oil, to transport, all this stuff's got to get take place, expenditures, before you start seeing a drop of income from any particular well. Knowing that, and knowing that all of this capital is borrowed money, at very low interest rates, never less borrowed money. 
Um, the idea for the Saudis is quite simple. Well, we'll force these people out of business. They'll go bankrupt. They won't be able to support their debts. Shale production will crash, and the price will then go back up. But that's not what happened. What happened is, again, a signal achievement of human technological culture. Although we don't look at it that way, but that's what it is. Production costs dropped. The technology became infinitely more efficient. Wellhead production costs for many Balkan fields, not Balkan, but shale oil fields now and tar sands as well, are somewhere below $40. If you think about this, this is an astonishing fact. It is a fact of technological culture, technological society, mankind's, the species, Homo sapiens sapiens, creativity. I know the Sierra Club won't agree with me, but then the Sierra Club um, doesn't like oil. Not that they don't like oil. It bothers them morally, I think. I'm not really sure why. Um, not to pick on the Sierra Club. But their view is different than mine. So that change is what made the Saudis and OPEC last November completely change their view, their procedure, their policy for dealing with the oil market. And what do they decide to do? Well, they completely reversed from pumping as much oil as possible and attempting to drive down the price and drive U.S. shale and Canadian shale prices out of the market, thereby restricting the supply eventually. It's not what happened. They reversed. They put in a production cut, or they got an agreement with the Russians and other, I think, 11 other non-OPEC producers. And has that worked? No. The premise of a production cut is that you restrict supply and thereby drive up the price, assuming that demand to some degree is inelastic. And uh, oil, de oil demand is, a, is pretty inelastic as a demand. Um, it's not like demand for vacations, you know. Demand for a vacation, you don't have any money, you don't go. Um, oil, many of the basic uh, processes and functions of society are there, and the oil needs to be. Okay. So what happened? U.S. and Canadian shale producers with many... Uh, with many wells drilled, simply replaced the supply taken off the market by OPEC and the others. And that's why oil prices have fallen. If we can take this as a, let's get a closer look at WTI since we're dealing with that specifically. This is WTI. in a five-year chart. Okay, WTI is da, 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 the purple, purple, excuse me. What we're talking about is this period right here, the chart, the oil prices over here, down here. Uh, it was 47 and a quarter when I made this chart about an hour ago. This, so back in November, OPEC and the Saudis, <clears throat> put in an oil price, uh, an oil production cut. And you got oil from about 40 all the way up to uh, 54, I think was the top right here. And what's happened since then? U.S. oil production has ramped up. 9.1 uh, million barrels uh, a day, I believe, in the last uh, weekly statistics from the EIA, the Energy Information Agency here in the United States. And what happened to the oil price? Well, it came off more than 10%. It appears that both the flexibility, ability, and willingness of oil producers 
has permanently capped oil production. I mean, oil price increases. The idea of peak oil has been dealt apparently a death blow by technological innovation here in the United States and in Canada. So if oil, and oil is the major industrial commodity, are we looking at emblematic of this a permanently low level permanent as permanent as anything to be for the seeable future for the next five years low commodity prices are oil companies and drilling companies and mining companies going to be a less than stellar investment for the next five or ten years now the interesting thing about the oil market is there were and these were known long before fracking became as common and one of the reasons why fracking is so adaptable to price changes is because the way it works i was reading about this and you know one of the things that's fascinating about markets and about prices is the practicalities matter a great deal. <clears throat> so most of oil, most shale oil drilling, fracking, takes place not on owned land by the oil companies drilling them, but on leased land. So a drilling company or production company will take out a lease for, I don't know, five years on a tract of land someplace in the Dakotas, say or in Pennsylvania. You can't do it on the New York side of the Pennsylvania border because our governor in New York has decided, along with the legislature, that there'll be no fracking in New York State. Um, I'll let that pass without comment. Um, so people, so these companies lease a certain tract of land for a certain number of years. And many of the terms of the leases are such that once the oil, uh, the, 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 the well is drilled, it can retain, I believe, a production right beyond the end of the lease. But you've got to get the oil well drilled. So looking in, in the period when oil prices were coming off and over here, when people had the, had the, uh, the wells and the leases drilled, what did they do? Well, the production companies actually drilled a lot of wells, but then didn't tap them or didn't produce from them. So they could retain the rights to drill in the future if prices come up. So that's exactly what happened. Prices came up. All of those wells, not all, many of them, came back into production. The ability to be this adaptable. was probably not foreseen by the Saudis. You know, when it comes to OPEC and the Saudis, they, they really didn't have a lot of choice here. They're not quite buggy whip manufacturers, you know, that great, uh, or Sears, if you're looking at it now. Sears apparently will eventually, more than sooner than eventually go bankrupt. They're, and it is, it's very interesting. Sears was the first mass marketer in the United States. Its catalog, the Sears Roebuck catalog, starting in the late, I believe the late 19th century, with the advent, of course, of trains, the ability to deliver the goods ordered, brought consumer products to the entire country. You know, I was reading this, um, the Little House on the Prairie books with my kids. And at some point, the family, the Ingalls family, moves to a, they're with the advancing frontier. This is the 1870s and 1880s, I believe, in the West. And they move to a new settlement that is on the railroad. And it's supplied 
by the rural. But not only is foodstuffs and other things supplied, but coal is supplied by the railroad. So the family in the town go from being self-sufficient over the winter by amassing wood to burn, to keep warm in their homes on the very bitter and cold and, and long plain, northern plains winters in the United States, where it's you know well below freezing for months at a time, and without a way to heat your house, you die. From being self-sufficient in this economy with wood, although on the plains, again, there isn't a lot of wood. So one of the reasons you can move to a place like this is if you have the ability to provide the fuel for the winter. So they depend on deliveries of coal from the train. But what happens? The train line is relatively new and untested, if you will, in Midwestern winters. So the train can't get through for months at a time. That means they can't heat their homes. So there's this incredibly uh, moving description, and it's in the book called The Longest Winter, or The Long Winter, I think. Um, they don't have any wood. The trains cannot get the coal through. The men try, of the town go, and they get together, and they try to dig out the, the train track, and they can't do it because another snowstorm comes through. But luckily for the Ingalls family, they had huge amounts of hay stored up to feed their animals, much more than they were needed. So they spent months, the father and the girls, twisting hay in the bitter cold so that it will burn longer than simply throwing it on a fire, which is essentially a flash fire. So the technology is what permitted the settlement here in these particular part of the plains. It's the same issue we have with fracking. The ability to sustain a technological society is what drove the development. If I think about it, if let's say fracking was let's say fracking was impossible, that it did not work. Somebody thought of it, they tried it out, they could not make it work. Where would oil be now without this U.S. and Canadian supply? My guess is it would be well up in the in the in the one hundreds. Okay, where's W? Oh, this is okay. Sorry, this is the um, commodities index. So imagine if for the past five years, the oil price was over $100 a barrel for the entire period and looking to go higher because there was no more supply. If the thesis of peak oil turned out to be true, how would that change our world? Certainly economic growth would be affected. Incomes would be affected. And we would be looking at a very different future. Until, of course, and there would be enormous amounts of money, privately directed mostly, but some from governments as well, looking at other resources. Because the need to supply energy to an industrial society is irrevocable. If we all want to live the lives that we do, then our culture must, and our society, must provide cheap energy. So the difference um, between the oil market, where there was this supply waiting to be exploited, and other potentially <clears throat> choke other potential choke points in industrial production are there let's put it that way oil is the basic industrial commodity 
if some form of rare earth metal which is necessary for all our cell phones and our computers runs out that's not a basic need not basic in the same way that oil is oil is in many ways a unique commodity because it underpins all of the other activities as i said earlier it is cheap energy which enables industrial society without cheap energy nothing else happens or it doesn't happen the same way and it's much more expensive so we could afford to run out of and i'm not don't think this is the right one but selenium uh something used in the production of cell phones and i would imagine that um the companies who produce cell phones and circuits would find a substitute But there really isn't much yet uh, on the same scale of availability and ease of use. There isn't yet a replacement for oil. So whatever we want to think about, however we feel about the idea of peak oil and what it represents for the interaction of our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, with the natural world, our planet, we must also recognize that our exploitation of oil and other natural resources is what makes our industrial culture, which we all share, possible. And we should all be grateful that peak oil the idea of peak oil turned out to be incorrect okay thank you all very much for attending i hope this uh little disquisition on technology and its evolution was interesting i hope everyone learned something we will see you next week i don't know what the topic is i'd like to say that this wednesday we're going to do the market directions interview with a well-known technical analyst here in New York and former colleague of mine, Edward Moya. That is at 10 o'clock New York time, Eastern Daylight Time now on Wednesday. Again, thank you all very much for attending. Everyone have a great day and we'll see you on Wednesday or next week. Everyone take care.